I want to thank everyone for coming today. Uh, we have a little bit of weather today, and, and now we're in November. We have these dark, early evenings. So appreciate your coming out tonight. My name is Hillary Bassett. I'm the Executive Director of Greater Portland Landmarks, and I'm very happy to welcome you here to our Land Landmarks Lecture Series this year. Landmarks' mission is to preserve and revitalize Greater, Portland La Greater Portland's remarkable legacy of historic buildings, neighborhoods, landscapes, and parks. We've had a very busy year this year. We have been active in research, education, and advocacy. We are currently reviewing a great many projects in the new India Street Historic District, which just was approved about 18 months ago and the City Council has recently expanded that district so that more properties will be, have access to historic tax credits. We are also reviewing the Master Development Plan for the Portland Company site, which is currently under discussion at City Hall. One of our staff members is there tonight, learning about the transportation and civil engineering aspects. This summer, we conducted an architectural survey of over 350 buildings in the Oakdale neighborhood, which is the neighborhood just beyond USM. And we will be investigating the streetcar suburbs of Greater Portland in the coming year. We're finding out some really fun and interesting facts about these areas, about developments at the turn of the century and in the 20s, and about kit houses, so you'll hear more about that soon. And for the winter months, we are working on a roster of workshops, tours, and special lectures that will focus on preservation in action. So you'll be getting more information about that. Uh, we'd love to keep in touch with you. I hope you put down your email addresses as you came in. We'd love to invite you to be members of Greater Portland Landmarks. There's more information on the table and in the, in the newsletter you picked up today. And we also invite you to pick, fill out an evaluation form. We have those pink forms on your chairs. Please uh, take a minute and fill those out uh, before you leave tonight and let us know what you think. Now, I would like to express some special thanks to some folks tonight, the Portland Public Library for providing the space and hosting this evening, uh, Ocean Gate Realty, who is our sponsor, and I think Ed Gardner is here somewhere, uh, Channel 5, CTN, the Community T Television. These lectures are shown on community television, so if you have friends uh, who have missed the lecture, please connect them to our public uh, uh, community TV channel. And then I'd like to thank our landmark staff and especially Alessa Wiley who greeted you as you came in. She's our manager of education programs and Kate White Lewis who is also here uh, who is our director of development. And lastly I'd like to ask you to consider a donation to support the lecture series if you haven't already made one as you leave. Uh, now, I'm very, it's my great pleasure to introduce our speaker tonight, Bill Kalina, who is the Executive Director of the Coastal Maine Botanical Gardens. He joined the staff in 2008 as Director of Horticulture and Plant Curator, and has been an instrumental player in the expansion and recognition of this nationally known garden. It is known for its outstanding thematic gardens and welcomes over 150,000 visitors each year. Bill is also a well-known author and recognized authority on North American native plants and holds degrees in plant science and psychology and has been working in plant propagation, nursery production, and garden design for more than 20 years. Bill's recent awards include the Scott Medal for Lifetime Achievement in Horticulture, the 2012 Perennial Plant Association Award of Merit, the 2013 George Robert White Medal for Advancing Horticulture, the 2013 Award of Excellence from the National Garden Clubs of America, and the 2016 Hobart Medal of Excellence presented by the Hobart College Alumni Association. So we're very, very honored and pleased to have Bill with us tonight to uh, speak with you. And I'd like to welcome Thank you, everybody. I'll try to project. Can you hear okay if I talk at this level? Okay, good. Um, I'm sorry about the little bit of wash on the screen there. They, they can't turn these lights off, so I hope that isn't too distracting. But uh, um, this talk that I'm going to give, uh, I, I, this, this came out of my work for many years. I, I ran uh, nurse, native plant nurseries, uh, especially the nursery for the New England Wildflower Society. I did a lot of work on 
on plant propagation, uh, got into doing restoration, that sort of thing. And so uh, there's a lot of information about sort of ecology and, and um, uh, the way plants move across the landscape and how you can kind of in, in some ways assist that. But before that, I gotta just turn my virus thing off here. Hang on, it wants to restart my computer. Always at the wrong time. It's not it seems to always happen. Um, but just a, a little bit, if, if you, you know, if you haven't been to the Coastal Maine Botanical Gardens, hopefully everybody in the room has. Uh, but just to show you a few pictures uh, through the season, um, we're, we just finished planting about 38,000 tulips. So they'll be ready to go uh, in, in May, uh, late April, May. Usually they're, they're in full bloom. The gardens you know, really just welcome you know, spring after a long winter with lots of color. This is a picture of our rhododendron garden in full bloom. It's about three acres of uh, rhododendrons. And, you know, just we try to plant this so that there's color really from you know when uh, from spring all the way through uh, into fall. This is our vertical walls. A few years ago, this looks like, after we did it, I thought this kind of looks like a guy bending over here, you know, like. Uh, <laughs> but uh, you know, it's just you know we, we just try to have fun with uh, with our gardens and uh, really our you know our our greatest love is connecting people with plants and just spreading that sort of joy and, and positive energy that I think we all need as humans to connect with the world, uh, you know, the, the extra human world. I think that's really fundamentally part of our humanity. Uh, so uh, I hope you can come if you haven't been before. If you're, if you're a member, if you've been before, thank you. And uh, we'll see you again. Uh, I actually just, you know, I'm not in my really fancy clothes because I've been out stringing lights. We um, if you haven't heard, we're, uh, we're, this is the second year, and the dates are a little bit different here. This was last year's card. So, um, but we've got uh, Gardens of Glow is opening up on Friday. It's the uh, biggest light show in Maine. Uh, we just we finished putting up about 375,000 LED lights. Uh, and so these are just a few pictures from last year. Um, and you know the, the children's garden, uh, this is the entrance going into the building a view when we actually got some snow. The snow really does great things with the light. Um, and, uh, you know, so it's, uh, the, the show runs from uh, this Friday the 18th, uh, and then after that Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday through New Year's Eve, uh, except we're closed on Thanksgiving and Christmas Eve. And we recommend that you go on the website and get tickets. We have different time slots for tickets to help with parking and everything like that. But, uh, it's really uh, it's going to be spectacular this year. It's really just, you know, I walked around and kind of just got into this happy days because it's, it's so beautiful. So, um, but we're at the, the, other, the other thing I'm doing tomorrow is going for final uh, building uh, planning and zoning approval for the first project in our next uh, phase of expansion. We are, uh, this is a, a plan of the gardens, including. The area, if you've been to the gardens here, this is our, you know, central gardens, but over the next uh, few years, we're going to actually move the parking to the periphery. Uh, we're we're going to break ground on a new visitors and administration building in January. Um, and then, uh, and then in 2018, hopefully build a propagation research facility so I can be, you know, not personally, but we can be doing some of the things I'm going to be talking about tonight. Um, converting our current visitor center over into a, a culinary center. Um, and then in 2019-2020, uh, build a 22,000 square foot conservatory. So in, even in the winter time, you can come and see blooming flowers and then add uh, double the size of our gardens, add more education facilities and everything too. So there's a lot coming up at the Botanical Gardens over the next five to seven years. Uh, so stay tuned. It's, you know, it's interesting when you, when you look out at a landscape like this, there's sort of a sense of, you know, permanence to it, uh, that, you know, these plants have been growing here forever. And certainly, you know, in the human lifetime, trees live a long time. A typical tree lives at least as long as a human, often, you know, four, five, six times or more uh, uh, than humans do. But it hasn't been that long ago that this landscape, you know, was uh, covered with, with ice. This is picture from the height of the last glaciation, you know, 15,000 years or so ago. And, you know, most of Maine was covered in glaciers or right on the edge, you know, in these areas where the ice was just, just right, uh, right uh, down the, 
you know, down the street, so to speak. And basically just wiped out everything that was here. I mean, that, and it's, it's not just here. If you think about, if you've been down to North Carolina, Atlanta, Georgia, or something like that, basically that area 10, 15,000 years ago had a climate a lot like interior Maine. You know, so they had the kind of trees, the birch trees, the firs, and everything growing in Raleigh, North Carolina that we had. Uh, and it's interesting, there's a, um, there's a line of, uh, of re plant research called uh, phytogeography where they go and they take pollen cores out of bogs and ponds and they can carbon date those and figure out what plants grew in a particular area going back. And, and, and in doing that, been able to sort of map out what the, um, you know, what the United States looked like during the Ice Age and after that, you know, the most recent Ice Age. Uh, so you can see the boreal forest, which is basically what we're kind of on the edge here now, was really uh, located more down in that area down in the southeastern U.S. And we were up here on the edge of the ice, uh, right along the coast, in, in what's, you know, tundra. Um, so, you know, basically this is what coastal Maine looked like. You know, this is taken up in uh, in northern Newfoundland, basic, tundra, really what it means is it's an area where there's uh, permanent frost. And so the ground never fully thaws out. And because of that, water doesn't drain. So everything is just boggy and wet. Trees can't really grow. And it's just a very, prim you know, very sort of tough, primitive uh, environment. But as the, you know, as the climate warmed, plants uh, moved back in. They, they saw the opportunities and migrated. And uh, you know, and move back across the landscape, and, and eventually the big trees of the eastern broadleaf forest returned, and all the wildflowers, and of course all the insects that are, that are dependent on those things, including the bees and the caterpillars, uh, and then the you know non-insects like amphibians, uh, like the salamander, and, uh, and of course birds. Uh, and so, in a fairly short period of time, we went from you know, tundra and ice to a fairly diverse, uh, you know, very diverse forest in the eastern U.S. and the northeastern U.S. But, of course, then uh, Europeans came over here and saw this great forest resources and decided, well, let's just cut it all down. That's great wood, you know, and, and uh, I think, you know, certainly Maine is a timber harvest state and you can, you can harvest timber uh, in, a, in a sustainable way, I believe, but the way we did it back uh, in the, you know, 19th century especially was really just to clear-cut huge tracts of the United States all at once. Uh, and then a lot of that never really grew back to forests. A lot of that was cleared for, um, for agriculture uh, and, and never really went back to forest again. Uh, we also inadvertently brought in diseases. This is um, a picture of an American chestnut, uh, which was you know, basically the sequoia of the, uh, of the eastern U.S., just giant trees. Uh, and in the early 1900s, a, accidentally a fungus was introduced from China that in, in 20 years wiped out all the chestnuts in the eastern United States. And that was an ecological disaster that was uh, probably the, the biggest ecological disaster for the forests in the eastern U.S. Uh, in, you know, in uh, recorded history because so much depended on those trees. They fruited every year, produced nuts that many things fed on, huge pollen source, nesting cavities, they lived a long time, they, they're just, they're great trees. And still in the woods, you can, uh, especially down the Appalachian Mountains, you can still see these logs that have, are still there after a hundred years. Uh, they're very rot resistant. Of course, we also built, you know, human habitation on what was forest too. And this fragmentation of forest is one of the real challenges uh, that face forest ecosystems because uh, as you kind of got from what I was talking about, plants move across the landscape, but they move uh, typically in, um, you know, in small steps. And if it's, if it's a, a big giant step you have to take from one patch of forest to the next one, it gets very difficult for many species to move from those areas. Some can move easier than others, as I'll talk about, but uh, that's another challenge that forests, uh, forest ecosystems are facing in this, you know, very human uh, dominated landscape. And then we have, you know, the, the issue of, uh, of climate change. Certainly the, um, you know, the earth is warming quickly and it has in the past too. We've had, uh, after the, the last ice age ended, there was this uh, period of interglacial warming where actually 
southern New England got up to temperatures that you know approached Virginia, um, and was there for several thousand years, and then it went down again. So you know the the climate does change, and plants do adapt, but it's sort of the pace of change that uh, that scientists worry about. That it's happening more quickly than plants can migrate to take advantage of new opportunities. Uh, in, uh, in one of the books I did, I decided to sort of look at, um, so this, was, uh, this was basically the, uh, a, a, winter, a hardiness zone map. Is, are you familiar with what a hardiness zone map is? If you're a gardener, you know that it's a, it's a map of average winter minimum temperatures across the United States. So uh, what it says is that in coastal Maine, this area, uh, we're in what's considered hardiness zone six, five, or six. So the, the, the extreme winter temperatures we average get in the winter time is somewhere between negative, maybe between negative five and negative fifteen or so. Uh, but what you know by looking at sort of the predictions, what it's showing is that uh, in this uh, what zone eight means is coming up the coast here. This is basically the sort of the climate of uh, coastal North Carolina. That our you know our growing season becomes longer, the you know the summers become hotter, drier, and the winters become milder, and basically uh, you know snow cover kind of disappears. So uh, what that means for plants is that the you know the distribution of species changes. This is don't worry about trying to read these maps, but this what this is showing is the um, in yellow at the bottom there is the current distribution of sugar maple. Um, and in green, the projected new range of sugar maple uh, in a warmer climate. So you can see sugar maple has migrated north into Canada. So we'll be buying Canadian maple syrup in the future uh, and not New England maple syrup uh, for the most part. But then other species, like this is the um, persimmon, which is the southeastern species. Uh, and we do have it growing at the Botanical Garden. It's a, it's a great native fruit tree. Um, but you can see the green is its current range there, and then the blue is the projected new range of that tree as it's migrating north to take advantage of a warmer climate in the north. Um, and this is important because, you know, obviously the you know, plants are the cornerstone of the food chain for just about everything else. Uh, the native species of plants are depended on by insects, birds, mammals, uh, you know, invertebrates, vertebrates. Uh, and when they shift, those things have to shift too. Uh, but I think there's also sort of a, a human context to this too, that, that um, plants give context to where we live. You know, when people think about New England, they think about the sugar maples. Uh, when they think about uh, the desert southwest, they think about the saguaro cacti, and when they think about the southeast, you think of the palmetto palms. And, and uh, so there's sort of a human context uh, that's uh, potentially is going to change going forward in the future, too. Um, it's amazing to see really what is out there in the landscape. One of the things I, I really try to encourage people to do, and it's something that we uh, teach quite a bit at the Canal Garden, is just to learn about what the native species are that are growing around. Uh, if, you, you know, if you're living, obviously, in the heart of Portland, you're not going to have a lot of them, but as soon as you get out of the center of the city, uh, then you, you see more and more species growing around. And this was. Uh, when we lived down in Connecticut here, this is a picture of our house there, and I just went out one day and just started counting all the different species that we had in the yard. And I, it's about 125, 130 species of plants uh, that I could just easily count growing on that six acre property. And you know, it's sort of sad to think about the, the climate shifting because we were really right on the edge for a lot of these things and losing um, some of those species to uh, to Canada as they you know were not being able to migrate at all. So you know the difference between uh, between this picture and this picture is there's more diversity there, right? There's more biological diversity in this slide than there is in this slide. And um, I think the you know one of the tenets of uh, ecological theory is that um, Biodiversity is important, and you know what that means is that you know with more species available in a certain system in an environment, the environment is more stable, more flexible, healthier than it is when there's less species. Uh, and I think you know, and I think that's true in human culture too. I think uh, it's been a rough election cycle, <coughs> but 
But diversity, I think, is a healthy thing. It's not always easy for people to accept, but I think, you know, it's important to, <laughs> to have diversity. So, um, if you're trying to, you know, personally, what can I do if I'm concerned about biological diversity on a small scale and a big scale, what can you actually do to foster biological diversity with all the sort of stresses we talked about going on with, you know, with fragmentation and, and warming and, uh, and loss of species and that sort of thing. Uh, there's, you know, there's large scale things and then there's small scale things. Uh, and I just want to go through a little bit. These are basically the, uh, from an ecological point of view, things that foster biodiversity. Uh, the first thing is a, a stable physical environment. And what this means is, you know, basically, if you look at these two different um, biomes, you know, that tundra, northern Newfoundland, almost at the Arctic Circle, and then the cloud forests of Ecuador, uh, and you think about uh, metaphorically what uh, plants need to survive in those different environments, if you're in the, you know, the, the far north, you think about what it takes to get through a year. You, know, you have to store away all the food that you need in a very short growing season that's going to last you all through the year. You need to build up stores, shelter, uh, to get through the, that long winter. Um, and so there's very few species that can actually do that. It tends to be limited number of species and they're very generalist and very tough and adaptive. And not to be, you know, no offense uh, hopefully in the audience, but if you're down in the, you know, the cloud forests of, of uh, Ecuador, you don't really need that much to survive. The climate is very stable uh, from day to day, from year to year. Uh, and, uh, you, you know, you basically have the, the plant equivalent of just a, you know, a, a bikini and, a, um, a, and that's about it to survive there in, in that sort of system. So in warmer, more stable environments, you tend to have greater diversity because it's, uh, you know, there's just less stress. The day-to-day -day survival is uh, stresses are lower. Uh, and so, as a rule, you know, as you move toward the equator, diversity increases. So that's one of the positive things about global warming, actually, that people don't really talk about, is that in a warmer environment, there's more potential for diversity in the north uh, than there is currently. Uh, but obviously, it takes time because, especially with plants, they need to migrate to these new opportunities. But in general, as you go south, you're going to find more diversity. Um, the second thing is that varied physical structure within the environment increases uh, the opportunities for species and uh, thereby increases bio biological diversity. If you look at this lake, um, it's, there's a lot probably living underneath the lake, you know, the fish and the algae and the invertebrates and everything that's down there. But then you wave your magic wand and create mountains in that lake. Now you just created a lot more structure, a lot more potential habitat for other species. And so on a, on a large scale, um, things like mountains are more biologically diverse than flatlands. Um, and you can go, uh, you know, go up in the mountains and you, if you've been traveling the mountains, you know that the north side of the mountains is very different than the south or the east side. And as you go up in the mountains, the climate changes as it cools and gets wetter typically. And so you can, you know, you can travel around and look, you know, then you look down the valleys and it gets, it's much more homogenous. So there, you know, again, you can't really do much if you don't have a mountain in your backyard. But you can do things on the smaller scale that foster, um, foster diversity to create more varied physical structure. Um, I think in a forested environment, the idea of doing something to the trees may be, you know, kind of uh, sacrilegious. But you know, you can do things to create more diversity by creating openings like you're seeing in this landscape too. So you know, sometimes you might have to do a little, you know, cutting of the tree. This is like the, you know, the uh, lumberjack's nightmare thing, where the trees wake up and start uh, <laughs> coming after him. Um, but uh, you know, typically what we have now in um, in New England and in Maine is a very even-aged forests because the way we cut all of our forests down in the 19th century and some and sometimes earlier. Uh, you have forests that are, all the trees are basically the same size and they, um, you know, and when you have a situation like that, it's like when you've got a bunch of, you know, you've got ten teenagers all in a car together. It's not necessarily a good thing, you know, so you want to have some adults in there and maybe some young kids and everything to just sort of 
balance it out a little bit, and it, it ends up with a healthier sort of environment. You can tell I have a you know teenager, but the um, so one of the things that I do encourage people to do is to uh, is to go in and, and sometimes thin even age forest to create glades and openings and stimulate some of the trees that are there to grow faster, but also let you know, younger recruits coming in, more diversity coming in. So you can, you know, you basically can edit your forest out, whether it's, you know, 100 acres or a half an acre, uh, to create these openings where other species can come in. It's sort of what we do at, um, at Coastal Maine Botanical Gardens. This is down along the uh, forest here, and they thinned it out. You can see all the seedling recruitment coming in there, where it was pretty much just even eight. There wasn't really much on the forest floor before. And so now we'll go, and we'll thin those guys out too, and you'll get more, you know, balance to the forest. So if we have a big windstorm and those trees blow over, there'll be young ones to take their place. And you can, you know, sort of take this a step further in a gardening way. This is uh, farther up the Haney Hillside Garden, where we're actually then going in and planting herbaceous species, ferns, wildflowers, and that sort of thing under those trees too. But if we had not thinned the forest out first, there isn't really enough light to let those other things grow. So you're, you're creating uh, more you know, diversity of habitat, the same way I did when I waved my magic wand and made mountains pop up in the, in the stream. Uh, now, you know, standing dead trees are important habitat for a lot of things, and if you just cut all the trees down or clean up your woods too much, you're eliminating that habitat. One thing that I actually do, um, sometimes if I, instead of just cutting a tree down, sometimes I'll just girdle a tree uh, and let it stand, uh, and then the, the woodpeckers move in, the other, you know, the insects that feed on trees move in, it becomes uh, more structure for more things to live on. And, you know, you don't want to do this right next to your house, but if you have some, you know, a little bit of woods where it can be off in the way when the, you know, some of the branches fall down, but it doesn't, the trees sort of rot so slowly that it's not like at it all is going to fall down. I have trees in my yard that have been dead now for like 20 years and they're still standing. Although some of them are getting a little rotten, and getting a little like I got to cut them down. Uh, and then even when you, even when you cut them down, um, just leaving some trees on the forest floor like that uh, is really important because that's you know not only habitat for um, you know small mammals, for amphibians, for uh, for uh, insects, but it's also a place where many tree seeds, as we'll, we'll see soon, uh, you know, that's where they like to germinate and grow and, and reproduce. Uh, so you can do, you know, create very physical structure in a big way with mountains and that sort of thing, but in a small way with things like logs. Even building stonework and stone walls creates niches for different things to grow. Uh, so I encourage you to just, you know, don't worry about cleaning up the woods too much. I hate seeing people go this time of year and blow out all the leaves out of their woodlands and take them to the dump. Just let them stay there and decompose. <coughs> the, uh, even lichens are you know, interesting that, you know, for many years we learned that lichens were a, a, a union of a fungus growing with an algae. And that was sort of the dogma. Um, and basically the fungus provides structure and actually scavenges nutrients and the algae is photosynthesizing and providing energy. But now they've learned that there's actually two different fungi in an algae growing together, and very different fungi, and that's why they can, people can never sort of get algae to reproduce, because you have to have these three things, come, three different organisms coming together to grow this thing, and they grow on different kinds of substrates. So from the mountains to the log to even the types of bark you have in your woods, you get different algaes growing there, and they feed, I mean, different lichens feed in there, and they feed different uh, types of moths too. This is a moth in the top there, you probably see pretty commonly. That's a, a species of moth that feeds, the caterpillars feed on lichens. The last thing that, you know, encourages diversity is this idea of low competitive exclusion, um, which sounds like a, you know, boring, uh, complicated thing, but it's, you know, fairly straightforward in that we, we probably learned this idea of the, you know, the food cycle, right? The idea that you've got the, um, the fox eats the bowl uh, and, then, and then poops and then feeds the fungus which feeds the tree which feeds the bowl and that kind of thing and then the sun provides energy into that system. So it's a fairly like a simple almost it's not really a linear system but it's a fairly simple system of one thing depending on the other. Now the reality is that 
Um, food systems are really more like a food web than they are a food chain. Uh, this is actually uh, a graphic that I took out of a, um, some analysis of a, of a um, coastal saltwater ecosystem in the Pacific Northwest, but you can use it for terrestrial habitats too. And what this is showing is that each one of these blocks is a different species, and that species has a relationship with certain other species in that system. Uh, and some species have huge relationships, others are sort of marginal. But what happens is that all those interrelationships are creating balance, like I was talking about, where you know that they, um, if one dies off, becomes extinct, there's enough other interrelationships there that the whole system won't collapse. And if, uh, if one is sort of verging on getting a little out of control and throwing it out of balance, there's enough restraint on that species too to keep it from happening. So there's also there's restraint and support, and that's what happens in a functioning, diverse, biologically diverse system that's you know, worked together for a long time. And when we see these you know, functioning, biologically diverse, stable um, plant communities or, or, or living communities, we kind of recognize them. We think about like a coral reef, you know, with all those different species, and none of them really is dominating. It's not, you know, you don't have one thing that's all, you know, that's there in huge profusion of lots of different species. Or you think about like a, you know, a prairie where you have all these different species of plants growing out there. Uh, and you know, so that's the idea of low competitive exclusion, that in a diverse functioning system, there isn't one species that tends to just dominate and prevent the others from, from existing there. So you, it, it, it encourages biological diversity. And one of the challenges that our, um, you know, our native ecosystems are facing in the, in the Northeast is uh, is the introduction of these novel species by people, you know. So I like to think of this as metaphorically kind of like the cables on a bridge, all holding everything together. What happens is you introduce what we would call an invasive species. Uh, this is oriental bittersweet that was brought in as an ornamental from China. Um, and when in, in its habitat, it is so uh, competitive that it excludes lots of other species. It grows so vigorously it chokes a lot of other things out and you get kind of a monoculture of that one species. So not only are you losing like one species from that web, but you're losing a whole chunk of it. And that's when you can get the danger of, you know, bridge collapse, of ecosystem collapse. Uh, and, you know, Maine has been fortunate so far that we don't have the invasive species problem that uh, you do farther south, but as the climate warms and more species migrate, we're going to be you know, it's going to be as bad here if we don't watch it as, uh, as the Mid-Atlantic is now. Where most of their native species are, you know, are gone or, or, or you know, disappearing. So, and not to be sort of doom and gloom, like what can you kind of do about it? I mean, you can go out um, certainly and, you know, and watch for it, it, invasive species. I think the, um, uh, it's important to, you know, be aware and to learn about that and recognize things as they're coming in. Um, and knowing a wildflower society is a great resource for that, for information on uh, invasive plant species, and there's a chapter in Maine, so they kind of keep up the date on that. Um, I think there's a bigger sort of question of, uh, you know, of, of ethics, and, and what, you know, what debt do we owe um, the non-human world uh, because we are becoming so dominant uh, in the world. And so I, I think it's really, uh, we have to see ourselves as, um, because we've kind of put ourselves in that position of, you know, this sort of domination of nature is that we need to, I think, have a new understanding of our role in the system as not sort of the dominator, but as, you know, part of this system and trying to heal the things that we've done. So, um, it'd be nice to say you could just clear these invasive species out and then just go buy the forest in a can and sprinkle that out there and then come back a couple years later and poof, it's all grown back again. Um, but it's unfortunately not quite that easy. Though there, there are things that I think we can do to manage uh, these natural systems and what, what I would call minimally manage, you know, the natural uh, landscapes uh, that are adjacent to human occupation and everything so that you know, we can create more diversity, limit the problems with invasive species and just make them more beautiful too. Um, 
So just looking at seeds and the idea of what we can do to help plants migrate and recruit and grow. Uh, obviously, there, there are two ways that plant move, moves across, there, there are actually three ways that plants move across the landscape. Uh, one is clonally, where they send out their roots and they pop up another place. Uh, the second is through seeds, the seeds moving and then a new plant growing. And the third is really sort of on the genetic level of pollen, um, pollen moving across the, across the landscape and spreading the genetic information of that plant across the landscape. But you know, seeds are probably the, really the most common uh, of the three. And seeds can live a long time. So even if you have an area where that, you know, you're in a suburban uh, development and, uh, you know, and, and it's been sort of degraded, there may be still some of these native species in the soil seed bank. They can, seeds can live underground for even 100 years or more. Um, and it, when the conditions are right, they, they pop back up again. Uh, and so it's a good survival mechanism for them. This is just, you know, some of the, um, some of the species that popped up in my yard uh, that I didn't have at all on my property. And they weren't anywhere nearby either. They just, it's possible that they blew in or they just came in from the soil seed bank. Uh, so you, know, you can, it, it's one of the reasons why I say, you know, if you're interested at all in botany, learning a little bit about plants, learning to recognize plants, it opens up a whole new world of, uh, you know, it's just like, to, I think most of us go through life as functionally illiterate when it comes to the native, you know, the non-human world. Uh, and, and, and learning to recognize plants and what these different plants are, it's like learning to read, you know, it just opens up a whole new world of understanding. Um, I, of course, like growing things from seed, uh, and uh, it's, it's really interesting to just learn when you grow things from seed, you can recognize when the seedlings are, what they are, and you really get an even deeper understanding of what these things are that are coming up out of the ground, good or bad. But plants move, obviously, without human intervention, and, and one of the best ways that they can move by seed is through wind dispersal. So when you have an area uh, that was you know, the glaciers just recently left, or uh, the trees have been cut in a clear cut, or, you know, there's been development disturbance. The first things that tend to come in are these wind dispersed seeds. Uh, they typically are small, or they have these parachute type structures on them, uh, and they move very uh, easily fairly long distances. And so, uh, asters, um, aspens, uh, we all know how dandelions move around. Even, you know, even uh, birch trees, birch trees have a great ad adaptation as do um, spruces and they drop their seeds in the winter time on the snow. And then if the snowpack is tight enough, the wind just blows them across the snow and they land somewhere new. And so you can see often if you go up where there's a lot of birch trees and this, you know, we have a pretty good snowpack and you look along the edges of houses and everything is piled up with birch seeds where they've been stopped by, by the house. But really the great, the, the kings or queens of long distance wind dispersal are uh, the ferns and the mosses. Um, ferns, like this maidenhair fern, uh, this is lady fern. Uh, if you look underneath the fern frond, you see those little, I was doing a Martha Stewart show one time and she called those caterpillars, but they're, uh, they're actually the little sort of uh, cap. And underneath there are spheres uh, little clear spheres, each one containing 32 or 64 individual spores. Uh, and a spore is basically um, kind of a primitive seed. It's a single cell uh, encased in a little shell, and very, very tiny. Uh, and, and they produce lots and lots of them. This is coming up uh, through the bluebells there is a species called uh, Diplasium. It's a, a, a New England native fern, glade fern. Um, and here, what you can do with any fern is if you pick it at the right time, when those little spheres are about to release the spores, depends on the species, but it's typically, you know, early to midsummer. And you put that frond on a piece of white paper or wax paper overnight. When you pick it up in the morning, you've got the spore print of all the spores that have dropped out of that frond. And I actually counted how many spores were on these two fronds. Um, this is what they look like all massed together. Each one of these tiny little dots is a spore. Uh, and I actually didn't count them all, but 
I, I knew that there were 64 in each one of those spheres, and I knew how many spheres were in one of the little slits and how many were on each leaf, uh, leaflet, so I extrapolated there were about 10 million spores on those two fronds. Uh, and, uh, and they just get picked up in the air and blown great distances. So uh, this is a, a great uh, example. This is a, a species of, of fern called Thelepterus quaterpatensis, it's hard to even say, and it, it is native to the mountains of British Columbia, uh, the Pacific Northwest. But there's one population of it in Grossmoor National Park in Newfoundland. So that spore blew all the way across North America and found one little spot up there in northern Newfoundland where the climate was very much like where it was from and settled there and, and formed a population of that plant. Uh, 3,600 miles, uh, of course, moving with the prevailing winds. Um, we all know rhododendrons and azaleas. Now, they're wind dispersed too. They have these tiny little seeds. They're, you know, you can see the matchstick for scale, and each one has a little sort of a papery wing on that. So when they shake out this time of year, they're in little salt shakers, the wind blows and they get blown. They don't blow 3,600 miles, but they could blow, you know, 50 feet, 100 feet, 200 feet, maybe 1,000 feet if they get really picked up farther than that. Uh, but for them to germinate, they have to f land in just the right spot. And it turns out that where a lot of these uh, species like the like the birch, like the spruce, like the rhododendrons like to germinate is in moss. Um, moss is another spore bearing plant, so any place it you know, finds a place to grow, it'll come up. And where does moss like to grow? It likes to grow somewhere that's, that's damp, that where it has some light, and where it's not being smothered by leaves and things like that. So like the logs that you leave in your forest, rocks, Places like that are perfect for mosses to germinate and grow. And then these seeds of the azaleas, rhododendrons, birches, everything settle down in there and stay nice and moist, but they know they, they've got light and they're able to germinate. And so many of these small seeded uh, plants, like this is one of the hydrangeas, uh, this is summer sweet, uh, native uh, clethora, um, it's pieris, another relative of, of rhododendrons, and uh, and perennials too, uh, wildflowers like goat's beard. Uh, this is a wild astilbe. Um, they, you know, they germinate in this in these moss kind of conditions. This was a stump in my yard, uh, and um, you can see in this picture how the moss is growing all over that stump. And why is it growing there? Because the moth, the stump had decayed, and so it holds moisture, which the moss needs. But also, it's up above all that leaf litter because those leaves just smother the moss and then it dies very quickly. In fact, if you want to have a moss garden in your backyard in Maine, all you got to do is keep the leaves and stuff cleared away from it and the moss will grow luxuriantly. You don't have to really do anything else if there, there's some moss already growing there. But if you look really carefully at this picture, you can see this is uh, wintergreen here, but all these little guys down here, these are. Um, uh, those are rhododendron seedlings, and um, and they're germinating in that little moss bed. And so when you when you leave those logs in your forest, you're providing a seed bed for all these and, and ferns too. Ferns love to grow on old mossy logs, and without them, they wouldn't have anywhere to germinate. Uh, you just have your you know your nice clean woodlands. You've, and there's a name for this. Two people call these foresters call these nurse logs because they know that. It's great for recruitment of all kinds of you know, species, things like the you know, mountain laurels too. Here's another shot of the little guys growing. And this is actually me. I, I got some rhododendron seeds and just sprinkled them into the moss and they pop right up after, you know, after a year. Uh, you could do this artificially too. You can simulate the environment of the moss. This is what we did in the nursery where you fill a flat with some um, for, for these acid-loving plants like rhododendrons, I would use peat moss, or what's even better is just to get, if you know what sphagnum moss looks like in the woods, is what peat moss comes from, but the green stuff. And you put some of that in a pot, and you sprinkle rhododendron seeds on there, and zip, zip it up in a Ziploc bag, and just keep it in the window. And after, you know, after a month or so, you'll start to see these are, you know, these little seeds starting to sprout, and then after a while they grow up into little plants like that. So you're simulating those kind of conditions uh, and then eventually, you know, transplant them out. So 
we, you know, we do a lot with these. Um, let me go back to this slide. What this, what this is showing are plugs here. Uh, and this is a great, from a nursery, you know, nursery grower's point of view, plugs are great. They're just trays of little pots. So you're used to buying, you know, annual bedding plants and tomatoes and things like this. But we use these a lot because they, they don't take up a lot of space and you can get, there's 72 seedlings on that one tray. And, um, you know, in, at, actually at Coastal Maine Botanical Gardens, we plant a lot of the gardens this way. This is on the Haney Hillside Garden there. Uh, just after planting, you can see all the little ferns and sedges and things like that that we put out as plugs. And the reason we do this is because it's really cost effective. Those ferns wholesale cost us like a dollar twenty, maybe even less than that, versus buying you know a five or ten dollar big pot. Um, but you can kind of do this in the woods too. I I had a, I took a tray of those uh, azaleas, the native azaleas and just went out in my woods and found any place where there was sort of a rotten stump or anything like that and stuck all these little things out in the woods and just forgot about it. And lo and behold, a couple years later, they're all growing and, uh, you know, got little seedlings all over the place in the woods and without really having to do anything at all. But just understanding a little bit about their ecology and what they like to grow in uh, really made it sort of possible. So, you know, again, like, you know, not to beat a dead log, but just, you know, <laughs> just kind of let those things rot and, and you can see here after time how everything starts to grow on those nurse logs and eventually it just sort of you know, decomposes and you can barely see it anymore. Uh, um, Gary uh, Smith, who is working with us, he's a landscape architect who is doing some work with us now and he gave a lecture for us a few years ago. Uh, he does great things with logs, like instead of just sort of leaving them randomly, this is a installation he did where he just uh, aggregated them into this sort of serpentine shape going up through the woodland. I thought it was really pretty. It's a way of creating kind of an artistic statement but still leaving the material there and you know maybe in a hundred years we'll come back and there'll be a serpentine you know row of ferns going up through that uh, uh, through the wood. So uh, we all thank you if you leave your logs. You know. uh, another thing that this rotting wood is doing though is is putting material uh, back into the system. Um, when you think about it, like, you know, plants need to digest their dead parts and reincorporate those nutrients back into the living system again. Uh, they don't have stomachs the way that we do. So all the digestion of that organic material that's, de that's deposed on the ground happens with the aid of other organisms, fungi, bacteria. Uh, and plants have figured out ways to, you know, to team up with these things to extract those nutrients out of uh, the dead organic material so they can take those nutrients back up. You probably heard about mycorrhizal fungi. Um, this is what, uh, you know, this is uh, the, the root, so to speak, of a fungus, the fungal hyphae or mycelium, and it just spreads through organic material and digests as it goes along. Um, but many species of uh, fungi and most species of plants have formed this mutualistic relationship where if those mycelia come in, of the right species come in contact with the right species of tree or wildflower or whatever it is, they fuse together and form this hybrid organism. So what we're seeing here is the, um, a pine root coming down, white pine right there. Here's the branches of the white pine root. And here's a, de a piece of wood, rotten wood. And all this white is the, those fungal mycelia. Uh, and they're diffused with the, the pine root. And so what's happening is this, the fungus is breaking down this wood, getting nutrients out, taking it, sending it into the root so the plant can take it up to grow. And the plant is sending down sugars from photosynthesis and feeding the fungus. Um, and this is a, not my slide, but it's a famous uh, a slide here showing a pine seedling and the, the pine roots are just these little roots in the middle. This is all fungal mycelia here. So what it, grit, it gives a huge advantage to the plant by increasing the root area of its root system, so to speak, by you know, exponential. Uh, and, but the fungus, this you know, mutualistic relationship wouldn't happen if there wasn't that organic material for that fungus to digest. Uh, and the plant wouldn't get those nutrients. And so when you take all that stuff off and don't put anything back, just like in your vegetable garden, over, a while, over time the soils start to decline. Um, there are some species that, are, that have taken this to the next level from 
mutualistic relationship to parasitic relationship, uh, where it started out as like a good thing for everybody, but now you know one side is winning. Uh, and, th and there are a group of plants called mycoheterotrophs, in that they, they, need fung they need to parasitize fungi for a portion of their life. Uh, and one of them is this uh, shin leaf, it's a, it's a pyrola that you see out in the woods in Maine, uh, distantly related to rhododendrons. And what happens with these is the seeds are tiny, they're almost like a spore, they have no resources to grow. In order to germinate, they fall down the ground and the fungus wraps around them and starts growing inside and then the seed digests the fungus and then uses that as energy to grow. You know, you've probably seen um, some of these, you know, orobashis maybe in the woods. Uh, you've probably seen uh, Indian pipes in the woods. These are uh, microheterotrophs, and in, in this case, they have no green tissue at all. They completely live off parasitizing uh, fungi. Uh, there are even ferns, this is a botrychium fern uh, that is, uh, falls into this category. You, you may be familiar with princess pine, the different lycopodiums. Uh, they are uh, microheterotrophs. So one of the things that kills me is when I go out into the, you know, in, in the holidays and you see people making wreaths out of these things. And um, not a lot of research has been done on the lycopodiums, the club mosses, but the little research is out there suggests that it could take 10 or 20 years for the seeds to even you know, germinate and feed off the fungus on it before they actually grow into something meaningful. And then another 75 years to get big enough to make a wreath. <laughs> so, so don't buy those cute little princess pine wreaths. You know, they're just, it's, it's completely unsustainable. Now if we were doing, if we were harvesting anything in the oceans that took 100 years to mature, you know, they would they, they figure it out a long time ago. But people don't really understand the biology of these. And they seem very common. Uh, but they take a long time to come back once they're eliminated. Um, probably the most famous uh, microheterotrophs, fungal parasites, are the orchids. Uh, orchids uh, are, uh, rely on fungi to, to germinate and grow. Um, this is a pod of a lady slipper um, orchid, and there's about 10,000 or so seeds in this pod, and each one is just, that's been stained so you can see it, but there's a little tiny embryo with a papery wing. And that is released into the air just like dust, just like the spores I was talking about. Floats around, lands down on the ground in the fall, gets covered over by the fallen leaves, and then it, um, it gets attacked by a specific species of fungus that wraps around the seed and grows inside. The staining is all the fungal mycelia growing into the seed here, but it's trapped in these special cells within the seed and digested. And the, the, that, that tiny seed then extracts all the nutrients and energy it needs to, over, in the case of a lady slipper, about three years, grow roots, grow a little bud, and then finally come up above ground as a plant. So when you see a, a pink lady slipper in the woods, you know, you never really see little tiny seedlings. You usually see them like they're not there, and then all of a sudden, whoop, they're there. Because if they could be underground for five years, maybe even ten years before they come up. And if something bad happens, um, you know, it's been dry or something like that, they can go underground for a few years and then, you know, and then come back again. So they're very interesting plants. But uh, the, an, an ex experiment we've been doing at the Botanical Gardens is uh, we've been going and hand pollinating lady slippers in our woodlands uh, to increase the seed recruitment of the plants. Because this is actually kind of a disturbance. It likes slight disturbance. It likes to come in on the edges of the roads and that sort of thing, as long as it's native soils. Uh, that are there. And so we go out in the spring and we have volunteers that go out and this is the, where the pollen is here. And you just pop this little thing off here. You can see um, there's the pollen. I've, I've got that on the stick. And then underneath this little structure here, this is the female part of the flower. So this is looking up from inside the flower and I dab that pollen on there. And then it'll grow into a new pod. And if you're successful, um, it, it grows into a pod like that. And then this time of year, usually a little earlier, like mid-October, so it cracks open and all those tiny little seeds flitter off into the, into the breeze and hopefully after, uh, you know, five years or so, three to five years, you see the seedlings coming up. Uh, and this is a different species. So it's, you know, it, that species can't grow if, you know, if it doesn't have the right soils, if it doesn't have the right fungus, if it hasn't been pollinated uh, by queen bumblebees that depend on all these other flowers to survive too. So there's a lot 
interplay there for that one species to be able to survive. So when you're, you're looking at plants that are more vulnerable to extinction as these species with these complex interrelationships to survive, um, like, like the orchids. Now there are many species that, um, that move across the landscape as seeds by enticing something else to eat them and then poop them out somewhere else. You know, so there's a lot of berry producing fruits and many of the trees, especially shrubs uh, and some herbaceous species produce these fleshy fruits that are colored in the fall typically to attract birds and mammals to eat them and then that animal moves across the landscape a certain distance and, and poops them out and then the plant and grow in a new spot. And, uh, you know, so there's quite a few. This is uh, sassafras, which is one of those species like the persimmon that is moving north as it gets uh, warmer, these beautiful fruits. Uh, many viburnums, we've had lots of viburnums in uh, Maine. Uh, this is another southeastern species, Chianthus. Uh, the magnolias are, are great. Uh, this time of year you really see the uh, winterberry hollies. Um, they tend to hang on longer and the birds, you know, the robins and things tend to eat them in the spring. Uh, many of the shrub dogwoods and that sort of thing. And I, I had this idea, I think when I was younger, that, you know, that the, the birds would come in and nibble on these and then they would fly 300 miles away and, and then poop them out. Kind of like interstate travelers, you know, on the highway system. You know, here's this robin and he's just passing by and, uh, on his way south. And he just eats a few berries and then, and then moves, uh, you know, far north. But the reality is, if you, ever, if you if you know about birds and you've watched them, is if they if the robins or the um, cedar waxwings or the other berry eating birds find a food source in the fall, they flock and they stay there till it's gone. They gorge themselves and then they fly a little ways and then they poop, <laughs> and then they fly back again and they eat a lot more and they keep doing that. So you know, so. You know, an interesting thing you can, you can see is if you have a, a you know, a seed source uh, and then you go like, uh, you know, 200 feet, 300 feet into the woods and you start looking around or, you know, reasonable amount of way, you'll see the seedlings of that coming up. These are, you know, these are sassafras seedlings, uh, it's native Aurelia, that's a black gum that are all coming up in my yard and I know where the kind of the parent plants are because they're not that common. Uh, unfortunately, this is what the, the best way that these invasive species move around to. Most of the really problem woody invasive plant species would have a bird dispersed. People uh, plant them in their yards and here it is, you know, here's the, the burning bush growing in somebody's foundation, growing in perfect conditions, you know, getting watered, lots of sun, setting tons of fruits, and then the birds come in and they feed on this and then they fly out into the woods in the back and this is what happens and they just seed it all over the woods. Um, and so uh, one of the things that I think is really interesting is that you can plant native bearing trees and shrubs in your yard and then the birds do the same thing. So they're, instead of becoming a problem, you're actually helping foster you know, that diversity. And so I like to plant you know, things like the dogwoods and the viburnums in my landscape and let the birds go and plant them. Uh, and recolonize the woods with greater diversity. So, uh, you know, be careful what, what you buy in the nursery. You know, most of these things like, like winged euonymus and Japanese barberry that are such a problem farther south are just getting into Maine and they're getting into Maine because we're buying them at Home Depot or another, you know, at a nursery and planting them in our yards and spreading them around in the woods. Ant dispersal. Have you seen these giant killer ants that are coming up? No, this is a, this is a great, this is a guy that does this you know, exhibit called Big Bugs that we, we we're hoping to get to the town guards in a few years. He does these huge uh, sculptures of bugs. But one of the most fascinating methods of, of uh, seed dispersal is, uh, is ant dispersal. Many of the woodland wildflowers like, um, like the bloodroot here uh, are dispersed by ants and certain species of ants. You can see that white tissue on that seed. It's called an eliasome and it's a fat rich tissue uh, and the ants are attracted to that. And here you can see um, I've scattered some seeds on the ground and within five minutes there's an ant coming and picking the seed up and carrying that seed back. You know, I'm not a good sports photographer so sorry it's not very blurry, it's sort of blurry, but you know, she's pulling that seed and up, you know, here pulling it through the leaves and finally goes down to the burrow 
and feeds that tissue to the young and then discards the seed on its compost pile. So this is an ant compost pile. You can see all the bits of dead ants and things like that in there. And then that, um, you know, that seedling sprouts up and, uh, and grows into a new plant. So many of these woodland wildflowers, especially things like violets too, are, uh, sometimes, but most of these showy woodland wildflowers are ant dispersed. Uh, and they're very ancient plants. Ant dispersal is one of the early forms of seed dispersal because ants have been around so long. And they're very reliable and diligent in if they find a food source and moving it around and protecting that seed and its nest and that sort of thing. But unfortunately, they're very vulnerable to forest fragmentation, you know, whether it's um, this kind or, or this kind. And so these are the species that typically you, you see coming back last, if at all, when there's been you know, disturbance and, and forest fragmentation. Uh, and uh, you know, things like the little Dutchman's britches and, um, and the trout lilies and hepaticas, you know, crested irises. This is the little uh, fringe polygola, um, celandine poppy, green and gold, the twin leaf. There's lots of these different really showy wildflowers. Yeah, you know, one of the other challenges is they, the seeds don't store, you know, so you can't buy seeds from burpee of these things and plant them and then they're going to grow. They need to be basically sown right away when they're, when they're ripe. The embryo just has no um, ability to store dry. So there, I've, I've turned this kind of seed hydrophilic seed or water-loving seed, and there are many of these native species that um, are what I call hydrophilic, that you can't just buy the seeds from a um, you know, in a seed pack and expect they're going to be alive, things like the trilliums here. Uh, and so you have to either just, you know, find them in the wild and transplant them or have them in your garden and move them around. What I typically do with trilliums is just plant the seeds right down among the parents and then they come up after a year or two like that. Uh, so there's a, there's a lot of these wildflower, woodland wildflowers especially, and even, you know, even sedges uh, that are, you know, that fall into this category. And these are really the plants that, they're not all ant dispersed, but most of them are, and they're the most kind of vulnerable to this kind of fragmentation and habitat loss. Um, some of the nut trees too, you know, like oaks, and this is one of the buckeyes. Uh, plants like uh, leather leaf, one of the shrubs, are, um, you know, are the same thing too, where the seeds can't dry out, and they need to be just, you know, they're made to disperse and germinate right away. Further complicating this is that many of these species not only can't dry out, but they take two or even three years to germinate. Uh, one of the most frustrating plants I've ever worked with is this blue cohosh, a native wildflower. Uh, it takes blue cohosh typically three years to germinate. You know, when you're running a nursery and you got, you know, you're trying, like, waiting three years for this to come up, it requires a lot of patience and planning, believe me, to, you know, get crops of this. But it does because the, the embryo, it's kind of like if you know, if you remember the story of the, of the kangaroo, when the, when the baby, the joey, is born, it's, it's, you know, a tiny little thing and it crawls out, out and into the pouch of the, the mother and then it latches on and then it, it matures. So the, you know, most of the gestation, so to speak, of the joey is outside the mother's womb, not in the mother's womb. Uh, and uh, with these marsupials, and these, a lot of these plants are the same way. This is the, um, you can see after, uh, you know, year two, there's the little embryo starting to grow. It just, and then this is all just its food reserve. So it takes a few years for that to even grow and get big enough where it can come up. Trilliums are the same way. They just, they just take a lot of time. And that's one of the problems with these woodland wildflowers is that most nurseries don't bother trying to produce them. Um, so where do, you, you know, where do you find plants like this if you're interested in trying to, to propagate them? Unfortunately, there are ready sources of wild collected woodland wildflowers, especially because it's cheap to go out into the woods and dig all these things up uh, and sell them rather than trying to propagate them themselves. But, uh, there are, you know, with the internet, you know, and if you do a little searching, you can find um, native plant society sales, um, specialty nurseries that deal with native plants that, where you can get um, nursery produced uh, seedlings to transplant out. Um, another thing that, you know, to be aware of 
it, with this, um, you know, if you're talking about getting plants with nursery as this idea of genotype, um, this is a, a picture I took down in Naples, Florida of a red maple, and this is a picture I took in Western Massachusetts of a red maple. It grows in, from Florida all the way up to Canada. Um, but that's flowering in February, whereas our native ones here in Maine don't flower till you know, April, sometimes May. And you can't plant a red maple from Naples, Florida and expect it to grow in Naples, Maine. You know, it won't, uh, it won't survive. So there are sort of genetic predispositions to a certain climate that plants have. And the nursery industry has become completely uh, uh, blind to this fact that you can't just call a plant, a, you know, grow a plant of a species and expect it's going to grow everywhere. I did this interesting experiment where I um, collected seed of a native viburnum, this is a hobble bush viburnum, and uh, we grew two populations of it, one from Brunswick and then one that we collected down in, uh, in Connecticut. And we were growing this out in western Massachusetts, and in the spring they all looked the same, but it started getting hot in the summertime, and all the ones from Brunswick, Maine died, and the ones from Connecticut survived. Uh, and so, you know, trying to get, collect seed from local sources is really important and learning to maybe try to collect your own seed. Uh, I really encourage people to go out there and learn a little bit about collecting seed. Um, I'm not going to go into a long, detailed thing about collecting seed, but basically the, you know, in a nutshell, if you want to collect uh, wild seed, you have to collect it when it's ripe. That's sort of obvious. And what are the cues that you can use? Uh, to uh, collect it. It's, you know, basically whatever it's in has turned, if it's a fruit, it's turned color, if it's a capsule, it's sort of drawing it out. If you look at the seed itself, you can see it even with the aid of a magnifying glass, if that seed coat has turned from, it's unripe, which is usually white or green, to like a brown or a tan or black or something like that. And then you can actually, with a big enough seed, cut it open and look inside and if the, you know, of course it kills that one seed, but if the endosperm, that tissue has filled in. But you, know, you basically want to wait till that seed feels hard and has turned a dark brown color. Uh, and that depends from species to species, but typically, you know, it's at least a month after the flowers fade, sometimes two months, sometimes three months. Um, and I, you know, in my books that I've written on native plants, I give, you know, charts and tables that tell how long it takes for these seeds to ripen up. But, uh, you know, here's the pods going and <coughs> seed shedding. And, you, you know, it's, it's kind of fun to and empowering, I think, to go out and collect these seeds uh, in the wild and grow them yourself. It's, you know, it's very much the same as, like, you know, uh, if you, you know, know a, a kid who grew up next to you, you know, when you know, like with your kids and you watch them grow up and you form this relationship with them and then you see them being successful in life and everything, it's very different than if you just meet somebody for the first time once they're an adult. You know, you have that deep relationship with plants when you've grown them up from, from seed and, um, you know, something like this lobelia. I remember as a kid, the first time I saw this cardinal flower growing in the wild, it was just amazing. I'll never forget it. Just a spectacular thing. Like, where did that come from? But it came from this tiny little seed that had gotten there. Uh, and you can see here that, you know, the difference between the cardinal flower seed that's unripe there, that white seed, and the cardinal flower seed that's mature there, that's dark brown. So learning, and you know, believe me, as my eyes get, they don't, your eyes, unfortunately, don't get stronger as you get older. So I find that magnifying glasses are great. Uh, and it helps me to see all these things. And, uh, you know, but you're really looking for those sort of cues for, there's the flowers, and you know, after a month or so, look where the flowers were, and you look for that darkening of the seeds and uh, the you know the parts of the that are left after the flowers fade. You know, some seeds are, are really really tiny, like like mint seeds. You can't hardly even see them. Uh, some are in big pods like this that are very obvious, but uh, you know, just just give it a try and you know, and and see what you can do and collect some seeds. <laughs> it's important, a little memory there, if you do collect these berries, that you sort of have to wash your fruits. The, uh, typically what we do with seeds when we, uh, when we 
collect them is just let them dry in air, the air for a while indoors. And if it's um, like most seeds, what I do is just run them through a screen or something like that and then collect them. Uh, but if it's a fruit that is like this jack in the pulpit that's a berry, uh, you have to you know, clean that out. I have this little blender that I use and I put them in there like that and you get, you know, here's the seed, the clean seeds. Or you can let them soak in water for a little bit. Wash that pulp off so they germinate better. Uh, again, if you're, uh, you're growing something like the trilliums, make sure that you do those fresh. For the most part, whether it's tomato seeds, sunflower seeds, or any other kind of seeds, other than those things you've got to sow right away, you really want to keep them refrigerated uh, after you collect them. Like you can, if you buy seed, you know when you buy vegetable seeds, and you never, if you plant your own vegetables, you always have leftovers. The seed companies want you to believe that they're not going to be good the next year. But if you just then put them in the, on the refrigerator door and leave them in there, they'll be good for two, three, four, five years if you, if you leave them in there. So, you know, they, there are some seeds, like I said, that don't last very long. But most seeds, if you keep them refrigerated, will last for a really long time. And then you kind of sow them. And then another, another trick that is, you know, important to understand if you're new to seeds that aren't things like tomatoes and marigolds and things like that. Most seeds from a cold winter environment need to go through winter before they come up. And so I typically sow my seeds of the wildflowers and trees and things like that this time of year, and then they go through winter, and then they come up in the spring. If you just went out and sowed them in the springtime, they, they don't have that winter chilling that they need to come up. And so really, you either want to do that, or you can sow them in a pot, put them in a bag or something in the refrigerator for a couple months, and that sort of you know, simulates it. So it's a little more challenging than something like a tomato. But in general, plants from these winter environments, they need to have a way of telling that the climate is warmed up enough so they can germinate. So there we go. <laughs> the end. Ha, ha, ha.